Hello, good afternoon for Europeans. Um, good day for everybody else. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you to today's consultation webinar. Um, it's about a very exciting project funded by the European Commission covering the entire European part of the Mediterranean Sea with the question of offshore energy resources and offshore grid potential. Uh, this project is being done uh, by uh, two partners, uh, Lighthouse Navigant on one hand and uh, Suico on the other hand. And from both companies, we will have presenters. My name is Konstantin Stasius. I am a director in the Berlin office of Guidehouse since 2017. And before that, for eight years, I was secretary general of NSOE in Brussels. I will moderate this webinar. But first, I pass it over to the European Commission, where Miklos Gaspar will give some introductory words from the Commission perspective. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Hi. Uh, so, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I can't uh, turn on the camera because uh, uh, I am uh, dialing in uh, uh, through uh, through phone. Um, uh, so, my name is Miklos Gaspar. I work in Director General Energy for uh, 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 in the European Commission. Uh, uh, where I am team leader uh, um, uh, coordinating uh, uh, mainly gas issues, uh, but uh, I am uh, uh, responsible for this study and I am very glad that this stakeholder uh, webinar is taking place. As you, um, as you all know, um, uh, the Commission late last year adopted its Green Deal agenda, which uh, uh, has set itself a strategic objective uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, to enable uh, uh, an EU economy uh, uh, which is resource efficient and sustainable and there are no net emissions of greenhouse gases by the middle of this century. Needless to say, this is a, a huge challenge to get there and uh, offshore renewable generation is a major part of the puzzle. And uh, this study uh, is in a way a gap filler uh, because it focuses on the Mediterranean Sea Basin, the, EU, the European part of the Mediterranean Sea region, which, uh, 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 which, where there has been relatively uh, 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 little uh, work uh, and analysis done so far because the work has mainly focused on the North Sea uh, uh, and uh, 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 partly to the Baltic Sea region. So this uh, study has been launched, uh, has been commissioned by the European Commission, also in uh, uh, in coordination and in, in cooperation with uh, with member states who were very supportive of this objective. And uh, the goal of this study is to determine the uh, uh, the potential for offshore uh, power generation in the Mediterranean region, and based on that to look into the potential for deploying an offshore grid uh, 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 to help harness uh, this potential. Uh, it also looks at implementation challenges. And uh, uh, yes, I am very uh, eager to, uh, uh, to hear the presentation and to, uh, to listen to the debate and uh, have your feedback on uh, the preliminary results of this study, uh, which will be key to uh, help the contractor to uh, to, uh, to finalize uh, their findings. So uh, uh, with that, I would uh, uh, give back the floor to Konstantin. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Miklos. Uh, I think Thomas Brejean from the Commission DG Mara also wanted to say a few words. Yes, indeed. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so indeed. So Thomas Brejon, I'm a colleague of uh, Miklos. Sorry for not being able as well to turn on the camera. Same, uh, same problem, or from uh, from my phone. Um, the I'm uh, coordinating the work on the strategy that uh, Miklos briefly mentioned. Uh, so I can give you a very brief outline of the strategy, uh, and I think confirming what Miklos just said which is that this study clearly uh, is uh, an important input for this, uh, for this exercise as giving uh, 
a very up-to-date and uh, I think uh, extensive picture of the potential or it's expected to provide this uh, clear picture of the potential of the sea, the Mediterranean sea basin uh, in terms of development of offshore energies. Uh, just coming back to the strategy itself, Miklos said it, the Green Deal in December has really uh, highlighted uh, offshore wind and offshore energies at large, so also including tidal, wave energies and other types of uh, offshore renewables as being instrumental uh, vectors to help achieving the uh, 2030 and 2050 climate and energy objectives and to really have a climate neutral uh, Europe in, uh, in 2050. Um, this strategy will uh, aim to give a way and to pave, give a direction on, uh, on how to achieve the goal of basically multiplying by a 10 to 20 fold scale uh, the capacity in terms of offshore uh, renewable wind and energy compared to today. Uh, where today we have uh, figures ha can be fine-tuned and uh, discussed depending on the, the clear geographical uh, scale you want to give them. But we are basically in the U27 today around 12 gigawatts available uh, or already running. And uh, the expected input from offshore renewable energy uh, by 2050 is uh, again with uh, its uh, range uh, around 200 from 200 to perhaps uh, 350 400 gigawatts which is uh, as you can see quite a dramatic increase and scale up compared to the situation today which require them to have very so high ambitions first and then to set up uh, an enabling framework which allows to have this uh, jump up uh, of, the, of the capacity. So the strategy will aim to give this direction, uh, set uh, not from the outset today already the whole enabling framework, but at least giving the direction how to have it uh, in order to have this uh, really a ramping up of projects by uh, already today, but expecting an acceleration in, in, uh, in the increase of projects from the 2030s and 2040s. Um, to give, uh, so this is work in progress. Uh, this project in itself is bringing a very valuable input and the consultation you are, we are doing today is also, I think, part of this, uh, of the, then the wider strategic, uh, strategy drafting exercise because you, uh, I hope that during the discussion today, there will have uh, then spreading of the, the awareness and knowledge. And I want then to announce here that in the frame of the strategy, we will be launching an official open public consultation by the beginning of July uh, with a proper questionnaire uh, on a website where any kind of stakeholders will be available to provide input on uh, from their perspective uh, in terms of uh, what they see as the needs and also the constraints and the challenges related to this uh, expected and needed uh, very uh, important increase of, uh, of offshore renewable energy. Regarding the strategy itself, just to give you some hints, we are uh, then addressing many of the issues you are talking about here in terms of uh, what are the regulatory environments? What are the market models which uh, which apply or which should apply to optimize the development of uh, of the uh, offshore energy? But we aim to also address wider dimensions, uh, maritime spatial planning. That's also related to the here to the to this study. But environmental aspects, biodiversity, industrial policy dimensions, because the potential of offshore should not be limited just to the coastal regions or the locations offshore or linked to the offshore, but it has to be uh, a direction which is beneficial for the EU as a whole. Um, and uh, linked to this, uh, the whole regional, 
cohesion policy dimensions, skilling, it's reskilling or upskilling of labor pools will also uh, be uh, at stake in the in the strategy. So you see that it's uh, <clears throat> it aims to be a very comprehensive uh, picture that we want to uh, to address and then to have uh, as comprehensive as possible uh, way forward for the development of uh, of offshore. So I will I will stop here, but just then to confirm that this study is very welcome in terms of scope and timing, because it will bring a much clearer picture on the potential of Mediterranean Sea, as Miklos said, which is not yet properly known in the perspective of what we want to do. Uh, so it will be a clear asset having this study uh, effective in the, in the months to come, because uh, indeed the strategy aims to apply again to the EU as a whole, so all the EU sea basins are at stake. So Mediterranean Sea has a potential. It should be exploited sustainably, of course, but it should be uh, uh, exploited, and other sea basins will be uh, will be examined too. So I will stop here. I, I wish you a very fruitful discussion, and um, I yes, I'm looking forward for the outcome of this study. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Toma. Uh, Constantine Tatros back here. Um, we thank you for putting this into the perspective of the offshore strategy. Um, we can now show you briefly uh, the uh, agenda um, where we will be um, showing the different tasks uh, on the potential of renewable energy sources in key production areas within the Mediterranean Sea, forecasting the potential generation uh, from those areas. Uh, also, of course, keeping economics in mind uh, because the wind speeds in the Mediterranean are often not as good as in the North Sea, but still in many parts economic. Then there's a part about grid options primarily connecting the different technology areas in the sea to the nearest shore. Um, and um, included in that are grid questions. Does it make sense to connect uh, two or possibly even more countries with each other via the offshore energy sites of the different technologies? Um, and uh, how does it look if you uh, have the entire Mediterranean in mind, including the interconnectors that the transmission system operators are planning anyway for the next decades? Then there's a part about challenges and measures to mitigate them and a final discussion and wrap-up. Um, if we go to then the approach slide, um, two slides down, um, the study started with the analysis of the offshore power generation potential, and Lou will take you through that in a moment. That was then turned into what we call production scenarios, meaning uh, input essentially to a market modeling and price forecasting uh, simulation tool that Sweco uh, was running. And uh, based on that, um, an ambitious and a not quite so ambitious scenario based on the national energy and climate plans were both simulated to see do the renewable energy options of the different kinds that you see at the bottom right, uh, offshore wind, both fixed bottom and floating, wave energy, tidal energy, and solar energy and other renewables on the islands, um, how do they fit into the European market, especially those uh, bidding zones uh, in the countries that have shores of the Mediterranean. Um, and uh, based on that, then, there was a development of an inventory of region-specific implementation challenges and barriers and recommendations for overcoming these barriers. Uh, several of the speakers already emphasized how important the stakeholder involvement is. And we're looking forward to having an active discussion today. It's not just a normal webinar where we're trying to teach something that we might know super especially well, like in many other cases. No, this is a consultation webinar where we're hoping for your active questions uh, through the tool, not speaking, but through the tool. And uh, we will be able, I hope, to answer 
some of these questions. We'll try to sort them as the discussion is going on and other questions will be kept track of and we will answer them then later on uh, in email traffic after the webinar. Your written comments by emails will also be very welcome until the 3rd of July uh, to help us make sure uh, we got a realistic, ambitious enough uh, look forward. Uh, what we're finding is significantly more ambitious than what's being planned now. Uh, but many of the participants, at least on the registered list, are from the countries that are concerned here and on whose shores the grid connections would land of quite a few gigawatts of offshore energy. So we're looking forward to your input. And with this, it's high time for me to pass the word to Lou Ramakas of our Utrecht office in, Na in Navigant, who will take you through task one. Lou, the floor is yours, please. Yes, thank you, Constantine. Um, my name is Laura Marcus and uh, I'm from the Navigant office in Utrecht and I have been responsible for uh, carrying out uh, task one uh, where we uh, did an estimate of the offshore uh, potential of renewables. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, on the next slide, we, uh, we show that we also, uh, to start with, uh, did a current uh, assessment of the current level of uh, offshore technologies in the Mediterranean area and is summarized on this slide. Uh, we found that uh, offshore technologies are currently very limited uh, deployments, only a few megawatts uh, and some uh, pilot projects uh, are present. Uh, the, the onshore technologies on the islands uh, are more widely spread. Uh, mainly uh, solar PV on islands like Cyprus, uh, Corsica, Malta, and onshore wind uh, present on Crete, uh, Cyprus. Uh, also, we looked at uh, plans and targets. Uh, each country has a national energy climate plan uh, uh, in place. Um, and there we found uh, mainly uh, plans for offshore wind in uh, France, Italy, and, uh, and Portugal. And these um, plans amount to uh, several hundred megawatts of uh, offshore wind, but also uh, wave and tidal. The plans on the islands, uh, they provide uh, an incomplete view. And what we found uh, is mainly uh, plans for solar PV on uh, Balearic Islands and, and onshore wind on Corsica, also uh, in the order of uh, several hundred megawatts. What we also did uh, before looking at the actual potential was doing a qualitative uh, technology assessments, which we show in the table on the next slide. Um, there, we looked at different assessment criteria and uh, with uh, a scoring of poor, moderate or good, uh, we uh, assessed each of the criteria we defined. What we, what we found and you can see in this overview is uh, uh, the onshore technologies have uh, quite some uh, uh, good criteria. Um, and for the the offshore technology mainly putting wind is uh, potentially interesting technology because it has uh, uh, high available renewable resource and uh, quite some potential for installed capacity. We also looked at the current uh, uh, levels of uh, environmental impact and shows social acceptance and these uh, Factors will again be looked at in later phase uh, where we look at barriers, of course, for uh, different technologies. Uh, after this uh, introductory uh, phase of the project, we started looking at the actual uh, available potential in the Mediterranean area and started uh, doing the geographic analysis. On the next slide, we'll show you. Uh, the different areas uh, we are looking at, uh, where it should be mentioned that we also included uh, 
Portugal, uh, which of course is not Mediterranean, but Atlantic area. Here you see the exclusive economic zones, which we used as areas assigned to each uh, European uh, country uh, for Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Croatia, Slovenia, Malta, Greece, and Cyprus. And um, an important way of, of, of working uh, how we did the assessment of the technical potential is using uh, spatial constraints. Not in each location it's possible to install uh, technology. Uh, so we set up a different set of criteria, so it's shown on, on the, in the table on this slide. Uh, which uh, set the limits uh, uh, to, to the areas where the different technologies were allowed to be installed. Uh, wind offshore with a, a bottom fixed technology, uh, of course, cannot go very deep, go, goes only up to 50 meters depth. And offshore and uh, uh, oh, sorry, offshore floating technology and wave floating technology can go up to uh, at least 1,000 meters of depth. We also looked at uh, distance to shore, several visual impact uh, limits, uh, distance to shore uh, to a minimum of 12 nautical miles, throughout uh, 22 kilometers, and the uh, maximum distance of 200 kilometers is, is because of maintenance uh, reasons. We also looked at maritime use and, and excluded fishing, uh, shipping areas, and uh, military use. Um, military use, of course, uh, was a bit difficult uh, because it was hard to get some information. There we used the proxy of uh, munition dump dump areas. Um, by the way, um, when I go a bit fast, the details of all these criteria can uh, be read in uh, in a report that is also sent to each of the participants. Um, uh, you can read that uh, uh, afterwards, find all the reports, all the references also where we found the information. Um, uh, conservation, nature protection areas are also excluded. And uh, lastly, we also excluded areas which were below a level of minimum available resource. For example, uh, for wind, eight meters per second uh, on average in at least one quarter should be available. It was found uh, that uh, commercial projects in place uh, at the current moment have all uh, wind speeds uh, at the hub height of the turbines, which are higher. And for wave, we set a limit of uh, five kilowatt per meters. I want to... Um, point you at uh, the slide, the, sorry, the figure on the lower left, where we show the depth, uh, bathymetry of the Mediterranean. This is an uh, important limiting factor for the possibilities of uh, offshore technologies. As you can see, uh, the deep blue color goes up to 5,000 meters of depth. The Mediterranean is uh, quite deep, uh, fast from the coast, so this, this is an important uh, limiting factor in uh, in the possibilities for offshore winds. Uh, another example uh, is a resource map. Um, for example, we show here the wind speed in meters per second, where it can be seen that, for example, in the Gulf of the Lyon, close to Marseille, it's one of the areas with the highest uh, wind speeds in the Mediterranean area. And of course, also on the Atlantic, uh, it's quite some wind available. With these bases, then we, uh, went to uh, determine uh, the technical offshore potential. And uh, in the next slide, we show uh, several maps of uh, this offshore potential for different technologies. The first one uh, on the lower, uh, sorry, on the upper left uh, shows offshore potential for uh, fixed bottom wind, bottom fixed wind. Um, and you see right away that it's only very limited area available because of just this reason that there is uh, not much area that's below, that's sorry, not deeper than 50 meters. The figure below shows the potential for floating wind technology. And there we see uh, quite some uh, increase in area because here we can go up to uh, 1,000 meters of depth. 
but there are also quite some areas where I excluded. For example, uh, in the middle between Sicily, uh, Sardinia and Italy, uh, it's too deep just to install these, this technology. Uh, for wave uh, in, in, in the blue color, in the right figure, uh, you see um, it's quite comparable, but somewhat less uh, area available uh, because of lower uh, wave potential. There it's uh, the, the Atlantic coast stands out. In the table uh, below, you can find the, the numbers and also in the, in the report where I detailed uh, uh, summary of uh, the potential we found. Um, it turns out the total available potential, if you would uh, uh, use all area available, it's shown in this, uh, uh, in this map, uh, is quite high. Floating offshore wind, for example, you have uh, 4,700 terawatt hours per year available, mm -hmm. which is uh, 1600, about 1,600 gigawatts of, uh, of offshore wind installed. Um, Onshore, on island, uh, uh, sorry, uh, fixed wind is, is is lower because the limited amount of area there we have uh, we find uh, 60 terawatt hours per year in 2050 and uh, 25 gigawatts. Wave technology is also uh, has quite some potential, well, 4,500 terawatt hours. But as we will see in a later uh, slide, uh, this this technology is uh, much more expensive than the other ones. We also uh, determined uh, the technical onshore pot potential on islands. Um, in the next slide, we show you a map uh, where the islands are uh, indicated. And again, here's a table that uh, summarizes the, the total uh, potential. Um, for example, uh, we find for PV on all islands, uh, total of 207 terawatt hours per year or 125 gigawatts. Uh, it should be noted, and it is explained in detail in the report, that we did not look at each individual island in this case, but used uh, an approximated uh, method. Uh, uh, we used for all this work our in house model for resource uh, potential determination, and with this tool we had uh, previously determined. Uh, onshore potentials for each of the Mediterranean countries. And these potentials were translated into uh, available area percentages for, the, for each of the nations uh, involved in this study. And then we translated these percentages and assuming that they would be valid for the islands uh, uh, in the Mediterranean uh, on itself also. So, uh, with this geographical application, we could determine areas uh, available uh, of all islands within the Mediterranean and assuming some uh, population density and um, uh, amount of uh, uh, buildings, uh, we could also determine an available percentage of rooftop, rooftop area. And with uh, this uh, technique, we were able to uh, come up with an indication of the average uh, available potential on uh, islands in the Mediterranean area. Um, some islands will, of course, have less potential and others will have more. Um, but on average, we think this is a good indication of what is, is possible uh, in this area. Then uh, we also looked at the economic potential. Um, we uh, did a study uh, looking at uh, investment costs and operational costs, CAPEX and OPEX of the several uh, uh, technologies involved, uh, wind, wave technology and PV, and a uh, detailed summary of all these findings are also in, the, in our report. And we uh, were able to calculate uh, levelized costs of electricity using this, uh, these numbers because we combined uh, the CAPEX and OPEX and an assumption about uh, cost of capital and lifetime uh, together with uh, the resource potential uh, resulting from uh, the previous uh, work. Uh, it just shows you in this, the previous slides. 
combining those two, you can for each location uh, where the potential uh, is available, calculate a levelized cost of electricity. Um, here you can see that um, the offshore technology uh, in 2050, um, uh, the lowest cost uh, you see is are for floating winds um, in uh, the Atlantic area, because uh, there, uh, of course, is this is mainly because of the high uh, wind speeds there. Um, the potential of bottom fixed wind is, oh, sorry, the, the economic potential and, and levelized costs of bottom fixed winds is a bit higher. But uh, we still think this is important because the readiness level of this technology is, is uh, of course, higher than uh, for floating winds. Um, this is this area uh, between Italy and Croatia. For wave technology, uh, the costs are uh, quite, uh, quite higher, uh, up to uh, 400 uh, euros per megawatt hour. In, uh, we also uh, did... Uh, determine a cost curve for the total uh, of, of all technologies. And this cost curve uh, is shown in the lower right. And here we uh, determined for each location in the Mediterranean, uh, the technology with the lowest cost and put it uh, on a list, sorted this and made a curve of that. So you see that if you, uh, take each, uh, let's say, a square kilometer and determine the lowest cost technology in that place and assign its levelized cost of electricity, sort it, and then you come to a total of 7,000 terawatt hours annually in the Mediterranean. Uh, you see uh, to the left, the lowest cost uh, floating wind around uh, 40 to 50 euro per megawatt hour. Then you see in, in black the, the, the fixed bottom wind uh, a bit uh, more costly and a bit, uh, uh, sorry, and, and but of lower total uh, potential. And then you see a jump um, because the, you see that the wave technology is, is uh, yeah, of another order of cost and is um, around 150 euro per megawatt hours on the Atlantic coast. And then it jumps even higher for the Mediterranean area where the, where the costs, uh, because the low level of uh, potential, uh, relative low level of potential is, is even much higher. Um, combining all these findings, um, we then uh, defined what we call 10 technology mix areas, which are shown in the slide uh, after this. And we uh, looked at areas with uh, sufficient resource potential, with uh, not too high levelized cost of electricity, but also uh, areas with uh, technologies uh, with high readiness level, and also uh, areas which were close to uh, load centers and or uh, close to plant or potential grid uh, connection uh, uh, lines. And then you see that we arrive at 10 areas, um, uh, the Gulf de Lyon, uh, Gulf of Cadiz, uh, Balears, close to Sardinia and Corsica, between uh, Italy and Croatia, mainly here because there is uh, this fixed bottom wind, which is available uh, quite soon, uh, Malta, Sicily, Ionian Sea, and North and South Aegean Sea. We also, uh, and it's uh, shown uh, in a table in the report, uh, determined uh, for each of these uh, technology mix areas, total potential and uh, the total installed capacity uh, per tech mix area. We did this by, uh, and you see this indicated in blue, defining production areas, which is, uh, are uh, production blocks of about 140 kilometers, square kilometers, which correspond to about uh, a wind farm of about one uh, gigawatt. Uh, 
And um, what we did was with these several criteria I mentioned, come up with a, a, a performance ranking. And um, we found, for example, that the, the, the based on the low LCOE and uh, high potential and closeness to the load that we uh, put the Golf de Lyon at uh, first place. The next one uh, that came uh, in this ranking was uh, North Aegean Sea, and the third one, uh, Sicily, which also has a relatively low C uh, LCOE and is close to a potential uh, quit connection uh, line between Italy and, uh, and Africa. Uh, for example, um, Malta and, and, and uh, Baleares are relatively low in this ranking uh, because they have, uh, when, as compared to others, uh, relatively high LCOE and are farther uh, from the load. These uh, production blocks, uh, we also determined uh, normalized time production time series for them. Uh, and these time series plus the uh, total production pot potential is uh, an input for uh, task two and three, the production scenarios and, uh, and then grid options. Uh, this uh, concludes uh, the description of uh, results of uh, the task one. And I would like to uh, give the floor to Frank, uh, who will describe uh, task two the production scenarios. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Lou. Uh, since the focus uh, obviously is on the offshore generation, the offshore potential that can be generated by the different sources, uh, we also need to put these things in context with uh, the rest of the power system, the generation that is uh, created uh, onshore both by other uh, intermittent renewables, by other renewables, by other uh, thermal uh, power units and put these into context. And that's what we do in task two, where we actually do uh, translate uh, all of these into production scenarios, which we then later uh, market model. So if you, sh if you show the uh, setup for the scenarios, uh, we, designed basically a setup for uh, scenarios in 2030 and in 2050. In each of these years, we designed a kind of NECP-like scenario. That means that it is a scenario which is more or less compliant with the National Energy and Climate Plans, at least in terms of the rest share, and takes as much as possible into account what is into the is plans already. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, we may uh, tweak and twist some of the offshore part uh, of these uh, of these uh, production uh, scenarios and say, okay, maybe here you could replace some of the onshore uh, renewables already in 2030 with an offshore, uh, uh, for example, offshore wind power instead. And in the ambitious scenario. In each of the model years, we keep everything constant uh, and just add uh, additional offshore power generation at certain sites to it. Uh, furthermore, the, both the NECP scenario uh, for 2030 uh, and 2050, of course, the 2050 one doesn't exist because there are no NECPs for 2050, but they are a logic continuation of each other, meaning that uh, the ways that are outlined in SCP 2030 scenarios are kind of translating into 2050. Uh, and that's the same way with the ambitious scenarios. So they are a continuation of each other. If we then look at the uh, first uh, market results out of that, or maybe the, the, how the scenarios are defined on the next slide, then you will see that what we're using On the next slide, we will see uh, which of these technology mix areas that are uh, has been defined, which of these 10 technology mix areas in Mediterranean we are actually using in our respective mm -hmm. scenarios. So in the 2030 NECP scenario, 
we're actually only using the Gulf de Lyon, the Gulf of Sicily, and the area uh, southwest of Sicily uh, for uh, bottom fixed offshore wind and, and south of uh, west of Sicily and in the Gulf de Lyon and uh, sorry, uh, in the Gulf of Venice and uh, for floating offshore wind in the Gulf de Lyon, but not to uh, to a big amount. But if you look at 2030, ambitious scenario, and increase the capacities in all of these three areas, uh, at least doubling. And we also add uh, a, a tiny little uh, capacity in the Gulf of Cadiz and the Spanish part. And we also add floating uh, offshore wind capacity in the North again. See, and if we switch to the same picture for 2050, you will see that capacities are increasing uh, in the regions that we're already using, as we said, Golf de Leon is one of the most cost-effective parts, Gulf of Venice as an area which is close to load centers, but we're also adding uh, the boot of Italy and we add some more capacity southwest of Sicily and we add uh, uh, between uh, Sardinia and Corsica, and in the most ambitious uh, scenario in 2050, uh, basically all of these uh, technology areas that are tapped into, except for the Balears, and as, uh, as Lou uh, defined, basically for cost reasons. So that gives you a flavor of how the distribution of those offshore resources that we use uh, is. Uh, taken into account in the model. Having said that, uh, it, is, it is clear here in that case that we haven't used any of the wave potential for the same reason uh, that we use, uh, or for the opposite reason that, that we use these uh, resources, simply because uh, wave uh, technology is too expensive. If we then switch to the total picture and uh, the capacity that we, uh, in that case, see being installed in the Mediterranean can countries in those uh, uh, four scenarios to 2030 to 2050 compared to the year 2020. You see a lot of increase uh, on the, the yellow part, which is solar PV, and that's onshore. But you see also a lot of uh, increase in the capacity on the light blue and mid blue part, which is uh, on an offshore wind. And partly because of the installations in the Mediterranean countries, but also for France, it's not only the, the, the Mediterranean part of it, but also the planned projects that are outside the Mediterranean. And when we run through this, uh, through our market model, you will see uh, the, the results to the right, which gives you a generation for each of these scenarios in each of the countries. And if we then switch to uh, the next slide, we can uh, double check that all of these scenarios actually for 2030 are compliant with the NACP uh, targets for, for the rest share in the respective countries. And actually, uh, we see that even for the uh, NSCP scenarios, all of the countries basically fulfill that um, rest share uh, as, as we des have designed it in the scenario. But uh, in the ambitious scenario, you have partly uh, a strong increases, and that's especially true for, for uh, uh, Spain and Portugal, uh, but also Greece. So we say check on that. And uh, furthermore, um, if we go to the next slide, to the next topic, we see that uh, obviously we want to have a market context in terms of what power price is heading uh, in order to be able to see where would um, actually, where would it be possible to, to um, maybe already to, to cover a, a huge part of the uh, production cost by the power price or by the captured price that can be received in the, in the respective region. And what you would see here is the power price simulations for the respective countries. 
um, for 2030 and 2050 for each of the either NECP or ambitious scenario. Obviously, um, what we used here uh, as, as a background information is uh, a CO2 price of 28 euro per ton for 2030 and 250 euro per ton for 2050. Um, so you, you will see that uh, generally uh, power prices are slightly high in 2050, 2030. And you will also see that as expected, you will have a slight drop uh, between the NECP scenario and the ambitious scenario because you simply push uh, in more renewables, which is replacing uh, other uh, thermal and more price setting uh, technologies. So you simply see the, the price effect of that. I mean, we try to translate that into a comparison with the LSOE. On the next slide, uh, you, you see um, comparison between the um on on the on the bars the lsoe of the blocks that we actually use uh, in for example the golf de Leon france you see that the cost of the floating wind that we use in 2030 in NSP is around uh, 55 euro and the power price is just below 50 and the captured price is about three four euro below which means there is a kind of support need uh, for for that technology, especially as it only takes into account the cost for the offshore generation assets and the internal cabling, but not the external uh, connection cost. But if you look at the light blue um, kind of bars in the middle, which represent the technology, the production blocks that are uh, built out in our scenarios southwest of Sicily, you see that the orange line, which is the power price that can be uh, received in, in Sicily, is covering actually the cost, uh, production cost for, for those sources, at least for most of them. And even the, um, the capture price is not much lower than the power price in these areas. Of course, that changes slightly if you look at the right hand side towards the ambitious scenario, which in turn pushes down power prices and it pushes down capture prices. So while you push in more uh, offshore renewables, there's, there's kind of a double whammy. You still have the um, Sicily part, uh, the, the half part of the Sicily capacity that we put in there, which likely wouldn't need uh, a rest support, but most of the other areas would actually see an increased rest support. And that is valid for both France and Spain and also for, um, for Greece, especially. And last but not least, we do a check on the uh, CO2 emissions, I think, on the next slide, in order to see, okay, how much do we actually decrease the, the CO2 emissions in all of those countries? And the line must show that a significant uh, reductions in line with uh, expectations. Constantine. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. Uh, this brings us to our first um, Q&A session. Uh, we've been watching uh, the very nicely active uh, discussion over our screens and um, some of the questions that came in, I think we can and want to briefly answer. Uh, it mostly goes to Lou, uh, the way I've seen, and some other questions um, I'll try to handle myself. There was early on a question from Roman Campari about the role of hydrogen, uh, for example, coupled with offshore wind. Um, a little bit more patience, uh, Roman, in the latter part of our presentation today, uh, you will see how we think, based on qualitative analysis, the gigawatts uh, we are determining might be economic. Uh, would fit with the capabilities of the onshore electricity transmission networks. Uh, so in some cases it fits well, in other cases there would have to be quite a bit of uh, expansion of the onshore transmission network and then hydrogen might become an option there, but we didn't study that in detail then. There was also uh, a remark about plans for offshore winds in Spain. Well, thank you very much, uh, Yvonne Pinet, for that. I will include that in our final report. 
Um, there is uh, one question, Lou, that you might be able to answer hopefully very quickly because we don't have much time. Uh, it was questioning the very high terawatt hour estimate of wave energy potential around Greece. Of course, it's not an economic, but only a technical potential. Um, are you sure about that? And why is that such a much higher figure than for the other countries? Well, uh, it's high, uh, <clears throat> but I don't believe it's higher than uh, Portugal and Spain, the Atlantic. But um, uh, let me say that the the what we call the wave roll potential, so which which is uh, a measure for the wave height, is uh, hard to come by this information. It's much less measured than uh, wind speeds, which is uh, uh, measured uh, uh, yeah, uh, on a regular basis everywhere. Um, and we found some uh, information about measured waves uh, with boys in the Mediterranean and had to interpolate that, uh, uh, that information. But that said, uh, we found that uh, the measured waves uh, in the Aegean Sea uh, were quite, uh, quite high. And um, that's the reason uh, of this potential. It should also be said that uh, as we um, limited uh, offshore wind uh, to be farther away than 12 nautical miles from the coast because of its visual impact. We did not do that with wave technology, as we assume that it's a technology that's floating on the water and this have much less visual impact. You can see that uh, if you look at the GNC, uh, uh, the red uh, areas uh, for floating wind are much more limited because of this distance to shore and uh, the potential of wave in the GNC is, is much higher uh, because uh, the distance to shore is not a limit. Um, of course, uh, yeah, it was, was said several times. Uh, this is an, uh, a first study and um, it looks at the Mediterranean as a whole. Uh, as I said, the, the, the raw potential of waves is, is less accurate. So, um, I'm sure. Um, let, let us let me say this. This has a larger error uh, estimate than uh, uh, for offshore wind, but still, I think uh, relatively uh, quite some potential of, of wave uh, in the GNC. Okay, that might be important because uh, we also got a comment that the ocean energy industry forecasts a stronger cost reductions for wave energy to 2050 than, than we have yeah. assumed so far. It uh, would be very nice uh, very yeah, interesting. Yeah. if you could indeed share that information uh, with yeah. us. It should be interesting to know uh, yeah, that information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there uh, was a question about floating PV, actually a couple of them. Uh, that was uh, not in scope. Uh, yeah. Okay, I guess the waves might be a problem, but not necessarily, but it just wasn't in scope, so we didn't study that. Lou, there was another question for you, in fact, a couple of ones uh, from Ivan Pineda. Uh, the spatial exclusions um, for onshore renewables, uh, but also, yeah, primarily for onshore renewables, mountainous landscapes, military restrictions. Could you very briefly cover that one, Lou? Yeah, as I, uh, I just... Yeah, I touched upon the method for, for uh, onshore, it's, it's of course more uh, extensively discussed in a report, but uh, we used, uh, of course, uh, the national uh, area available, but these area percentages were based on the same kind of uh, exclusion uh, criteria as we uh, applied for the offshore technology. So for onshore, uh, these involved uh, built-up areas, elevation, high slopes, uh, land use, uh, protection zones, and also, of course, the raw resource level. Just yes, these, these uh, uh, percentages we used from our previous work, from our in-house resource tool, uh, were based on the same kind of uh, uh, spatial exclusion criteria as, as for uh, offshore. Yeah. And on the islands, there's also a question why a concentrated solar power CSP uh, wasn't assessed or partly was not in the scope uh, of the study. But then uh, many of these islands are fairly small, so the potential uh, may not be so large. Lou, can you super briefly expand on that one? Uh, yes, it's just just as floating PV is not was not in the scope of our project, 
uh, CSP installations uh, would be mainly possible on the larger islands only, I think. Uh, but yeah, as I said we did not uh, did not look at uh, at that. No. Okay. Um, there was a question whether the assumptions would be shared, so you can all look at them in much more detail. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, after this um, uh, webinar, we'll share with you the second interim report, which is quite long, a couple of hundred pages, um, as a basis for your further commenting that we look forward to until the 3rd of uh, July. Um, and uh, also, uh, Sandro Lowry, uh, yes, uh, the potential accounts for environmental constraints and alternative uses, uh, various kinds of both of them. Um, uh, there is a question from Ricardo Vailati uh, on uh, for the next few years whether onshore wind on the islands might not be by far the most economic option. But I would see that more differentiated, but I'd ask for a bit of patience, uh, Ricardo, for the further results uh, that are coming up within the next hour that partially at least uh, answer your question. Uh, floating offshore wind options are countries, for example, France, and, and that might go away. Finally, for the last question that I think we might have uh, time to answer right now, um, Lou uh, Malta uh, got the number three out of our 10 technology areas. Uh, in the end, uh, when the economics come in, it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be doing so well. Can you very briefly shed light on that? I think there's some, some misunderstanding. Um, first, the numbers here you sh shown in this picture don't show the ranking that's perhaps uh, confusing first we just defined uh, areas uh, yeah arbitrarily uh, and malta is, is not on third place it's, it's one of the lowest ranks uh, but perhaps i was not clear in explaining that malta and the balayas are uh, ninth and tenth in our ranking and on third in third place uh, was sicily Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, we're still getting comments in. Maybe one last one that uh, I can cover myself briefly from Volker Wendt uh, on the uh, local diesel generators, which are a primary source of power in the med on the islands right now. Yes, there's a lot of work going on with islands. Some of it has been done by Navigant itself uh, for the European Commission, but the decarbonization of the islands per se is not the focus of the study here. It's an offshore grid, um, often on a gigawatt scale. Um, but you'll see in the upcoming parts of the presentation how island-based PV uh, and onshore wind uh, does or does not play a role and where it plays a role in those uh, bigger offshore energy grid questions. Um, I I think um, with that, uh, we should go in the interest of time to the next part, which will be done by uh, Simon Lindroth uh, from Suico together with Lou Ramakas on task three. Uh, Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, task three then is about the uh, possible grid connection of the different uh, production uh, zones that were defined in the task two. So uh, in the next slide, there's a brief overview of the steps of this analysis, which is to uh, look at the different technology mix areas, that is the different parts of the Mediterranean where we have defined some potential and uh, made a selection and looking at how these uh, areas can be connected to the grid and following that, doing a cost benefit analysis of these connections or the entire system of it. And uh, the outputs of this are the cost benefit analysis and uh, some qualitative uh, conclusions on the impact of the onshore grids for this for the 2030 scenarios and also a brief overview of possible offshore infrastructure projects that are um, being planned uh, nearby where we have the technology mix areas. So just as a few um, steps to show you the different steps done here this this concerns a lot of sites and a lot of data so we had to make a uh, uh, a method which uh, could do this in the time at hand and this was done in a three-step way where firstly a base alternative was studied meaning a radial connection of each production block so each site where there is a production defined just draw a radial to the closest station on shore in the same country and 
that is a um, step which uh, could be uh, illustrative of a uh, realization where the different uh, sites are uh, are being built one by one and looking at uh, some way of, of uh, doing a partial optimization of this to better utilize the equipment would be to group things instead. So that would be the next step, looking at what we call a partial optimization, where production blocks that are connecting to the same station on shore are instead grouped and are assumed to share a common link, leading to lower costs for the installation, but also a little bit lower redundancy because the different production blocks become dependent of each other. And the third step then is uh, that we have looked if there are obvious benefits of doing other types of connections. There are numerous ways of connecting the sites to shore, so we cannot possibly look at all of them. But if there are obvious benefits of doing it uh, in a certain way, we have looked at one such option maximum per site. And that could, for instance, be how it looks to the right in this picture, uh, integrating the production blocks in a loop so that there is a mesh, meshed connection to shore and so that also there is a uh, cross-country link formed through these connections. This will obviously be more expensive than just doing a radial connection, but will lead to the possibility of using the link for other options as well. So those are the general three steps of the analysis, and uh, I will not go through all the details of all the technology mix areas, but I will highlight uh, how this was done for one example, which is Golf de Lyon, where the... Uh, Oh yes, I will first briefly just mention some technical details of this uh, for those interested on how we made some assumptions to make this uh, doable. We've assumed connection only to the high voltage grid onshore. Uh, we've only looked at cable connections. The voltage levels chosen for AC and DC were the ones listed there, 220 kilovolts for AC or 300 or 500 kilovolts for DC. And the choice of each, uh, which technology we, uh, we chose was made on the 25 year total cost. As you saw in the previous pictures and we'll see in the coming pictures as well, we've only looked at straight line connections. We've not made detailed studies of the cable paths. For the grouping of production blocks that I showed you in the middle image on the previous slide, we've grouped production blocks up to a size of two gigawatts and we have not considered how uh, specifically to interconnect the production blocks to each other before utilizing the common link, meaning that the costs have been calculated based on a, a total power and average distance to shore. And for the uh, optional connection that I showed to the right uh, in the previous slide, is uh, if you could click once more, then there's uh, a couple of assumptions there that we've only considered that if we've found obvious benefits and we've limited it to a maximum of one optional connection per technology mix area. So moving then to the example of uh, Golf de Lyon, we can see here the three different uh, options for one of the four scenarios. Just as a quick reminder, there were two scenarios for 2030 and two scenarios for 2050. This is for the uh, 2030 ambitious scenario. With the radial connection to the left, the partially optimized, that is shared link to shore in the middle and an optional connection to the right where we've added a cross country link um, forming a bridge between the two groups of production blocks belonging to France in the northern part and to Spain in the southern part. And uh, this link we've dimension so that the entire link become as strong as the strongest part, which is then in this, for this example, it's 4.5 gigawatts. So if you click once or twice more, is that to just get those arrows out. And at the, um, these are the CapEx figures for these uh, connections, some 2 million euros for the base connection, uh, significantly lower for the partially optimized and then higher again for the optional since we've added some extra extra functions to that link. Moving to the next slide, there's uh, just a brief overview of the all of the nine production uh, or technology mix areas with production blocks. Uh, not going into any detail here either, but just briefly going through from left to right in the upper row. It's the Gulf of Venice or Gulf de Lyon, I mean, with uh, France and Spain connecting. The next one is the Malta region. Then there's the boot of Italy and the North and South Aegean Sea, respectively, in the top row to the right. And on the lower row, there's the Corsica Sardinia, the Sicily one, the Gulf of Cadiz, uh, connecting to Portugal and to Spain. And finally, the Gulf of Venice, where there are connections to both Italy uh, down to the left and up to Croatia, up to the right.
And for the two, I already show you the image of the uh, Golf de Lyon with the optional connection. I will show you two more optional connections in the next slide where the choice for Malta, if we were not to go to the uh, transmission grid on Sicily, uh, the option of connecting straight to Malta has been studied, where uh, that would then assume utilizing the, the link that exists from Malta to, uh, to uh, Sicily. If you click uh, once more, is a uh, Get that one. And the optional connection for the Gulf of Venice is uh, similar to the Gulf de Lyon to interconnect uh, Croatia and Italy uh, through uh, adding an extra link there between the groups of production blocks belonging to each country. The next step of this analysis was then to uh, consider uh, interconnections between different technology mix areas. So in this image you have in blue the different technology mix areas that were numbered by Lou previously. And uh, the conclusion here was to look at the distances between any two technology mix areas and realize that they are very large indeed, uh, especially large as compared to the distances to shore and the distances that would be uh, possible to to make uh, strengthening so the transmission grids on shore instead. So this uh, option has been excluded due to these large distances. So that is the, the connection of technology mix areas has not been found feasible. However, we also made a, a comparison of the projected uh, projects around the Mediterranean as defined by the NSOE, 10 year network development plan, and found a number of sites where it could be worth um, mentioning that there are planned projects uh, passing through the uh, same uh, area as the uh, different technology mix areas and the, specifically it's for the region uh, uh, near uh, Sicily where there is a uh, planned uh, interconnector between Sicily and Tunisia. There's also the same is true for the uh, region around Corsica Sardinia where there's a planned interconnector from central Italy to Tunisia and uh, the same is true for Greece in the South Aegean Sea where there is a planned interconnector from Greece to um, to Crete, uh, on through Cyprus, on through to Israel, where there is um, a possibility to um, to uh, suggest um, coordination benefits of these projects. The other uh, purple circles that I have not mentioned so far is the one with the Gulf of Cadiz, where there are plans for a connection from Portugal to Morocco, uh, also passing possibly through the technology mix area there. There are some things to be said about the Golf de Lyon, south of France, uh, east of Spain, where there are planned interconnection strengthening projects going on across the Pyrenees, where if a cross-country link was, was um, realized in the Golf de Lyon, it would uh, provide uh, additional support to the cross-Pyrenees connection. For the uh, Technology mix area in the Gulf of Venice. Uh, there are grid strengthening projects uh, planned both on the Croatian side and on the, the Italian side, as well as a planned link uh, between uh, Slovenia and, uh, and Italy. All of these uh, could uh, be beneficial to the ejection of power from this technology mix area. And the uh, final step of this analysis was then to look at the injection into the different national grids in the scenarios for 2030 and make some qualitative conclusions on the grid impact of these injections. And for the 2030 scenario, injections were defined in the this scenario at three points, that is uh, into Sicily, into uh, France from the Golf de Lyon and into Italy from the Gulf of Venice. And the impact of these three injection was uh, uh, qualitatively analyzed as being uh, major in two of these points and minor in one of them. If you click once more, Isa. Where the injection into the southern part of France is quite large uh, and the uh, grid in that region is quite congested already. So it's likely that major grid in, in reinforcements would have to be made there. Whereas the injection into the northern part of Italy is not as large. And this also comes into a part of the grid which is stronger and which might also alleviate some of the general flow from south to north in Italy. Whereas the injection into Sicily would likely uh, uh, mean, although it's not as large as the one into France, would likely mean uh, major reinforcements being necessary since the connection from Sicily to the mainland Italy is a known weak point or a bottleneck and uh, the grid down there is uh, already quite congested. Moving on to the other scenario for 2030, which is the ambitious scenario for 2030. 
some injections occur in some other places uh, to the west, in the west part of this image into uh, Spain with 200 megawatts. That is, uh, was analyzed as possibly being uh, enough with some minor reinforcements to take care of that. The uh, injections into France increases, and there's also an injection into Spain in this scenario with 1.8 gigawatts. And both of these are assumed to, to uh, lead to um, major reinforcement needs in those countries. The injection in northern part of Italy grows to 4 gigawatts, uh, meaning that the uh, consequences for the grid become larger as well, whereas the injection into, um, into uh, Croatia uh, is, is of a smaller magnitude and might suffice with minor, minor reinforcements. Sicily was already mentioned, major reinforcement here as well, whereas the injection into Greece uh, might suffice with minor Enforcements is this is an injection into a heavy load center where a big part of the load in Greece is in the Athens region where this injection is being made. So those are the qualitative analysis of that, and uh, with those words, I will leave the floor to uh, Frank. Uh, thank you, Simon. So what we as an, did as a next step is then assessing uh, the, the economic effects of both the ambitious versus the NSAP scenario for each of the model years 2030 and 2050, but also assessing the uh, economic value of uh, the two interconnectors that have been uh, proposed, and that is Spain and France via the technology mix area in the Gulf uh, de Lyon and uh, Italy, Croatia via the technology mix uh, area in the Gulf of Venice. So for each of these uh, production scenarios, we did uh, study the economic effects for the different grid scenarios. And uh, on the next slide, you will actually see already some of the results and the methodologies that we used to basically uh, using the NCOE uh, methodology and the indicators C1 and 2, which is CAPEX and OPEX, and on the benefit side, indicators uh, B1, social economic welfare impact, B2, uh, savings in CO2 emissions, B3, rest integration, and also some of the losses. Uh, so if you look at the results, um, you will see on the next slide that uh, there is a possibility uh, to have a lot of rest integration, obviously, with the scenarios that's inherent in the, in the scenarios. And for 2030, in the uh, NECP scenario, it's two gigawatt that you install. In the ambitious scenario, it's 13 gigawatt that you actually install in the Mediterranean countries as such. And you will see the capex outlined on the bars, uh, which is about, uh, yeah, split it into both the capex for the uh, offshore bottom fixed offshore uh, part which is the light blue one and the floating wind offshore part which is the, the, the more mid blue or dark blue one and the orange part is actually the external grid connection cost connected to it and on the right hand side you see the emission uh, savings the co2 emission savings uh, for each of the scenarios as compared relatively to the uh, 2030 NECP scenario. So you will see that all the ambitious scenarios show a significant decrease for the <laughs> savings in CO2 emissions. And the split is made for the Mediterranean countries in green and all other European countries in black. And you will see that, for example, um, on the uh, second scenario to the right, which is actually the uh, ambitious 2030 scenario, which uses the ex uh, additional interconnector between uh, France and Spain, you have an additional saving in CO2 in the Mediterranean countries. Uh, going to the next uh, topic, uh, showing the socioeconomic effects of that uh, in terms of producer surplus, consumer surplus, and congestion rent, uh, and basically focusing on the two options that we have here at hand, which are the uh, 
uh, interconnector option of France Spain, uh, which is on the right hand side on the top. We can conclude that uh, looking at the, the impact on the different countries, uh, what we what we do see is a uh, since the, so the prices before the interconnection are slightly low, power prices are slightly lower in Spain than they are in France. So the additional interconnection, also in addition to the already uh, discussed uh, grid reinforcements in, in the Pyrenees, they will still increase the producer surplus in Spain. They will slightly lower the producer surplus in France. Uh, they will increase the congestion rent on, on the French side and they will definitely uh, increase the consumer surplus in France while it is more or less uh, equal and, and, and the remaining countries and, and the, the surroundings so of those two. So from that point of view, uh, there are some indications that the additional capacity provided through the technology mix area one uh, might be uh, meaningful. Uh, and uh, looking at Croatia and Italy, uh, the effects that we uh, get from the market modeling and the socioeconomic uh, results are not that clear and not that promising. So our conclusion is that um, it's not obvious that there are actually any big benefits to gain. So uh, if we then look for the total result on the next slide, you will see when we sum up the uh, all the all the benefits that can be monetized easily, the welfare economics uh, on on one hand side, as opposed to the uh, cost for the power generation and the external grid connection. Uh, you will see that uh, the scenario, which is the second to the right uh, uh, on, on the left graph, uh, uh, is the one with the highest uh, sum of cost and benefits, the dot re uh, actually representing the, the total there. And that is the scenario 2030 ambitious, which has the additional interconnect between France and Spain. Uh, and just to be clear on that, these calculations are made with a CO2 cost that is equal to the EU ETS price. We haven't added any uh, subtitle cost for uh, uh, additional avoidance of CO2 emissions, which you could do according to, to the methodology. Uh, but just for the sake of argument, we did that on, on the right hand side and said, uh, uh, set the, the societal cost for CO2 to 150 which then obviously makes uh, these additional um, uh, and, and more ambitious uh, offshore mm -hmm. generation scenarios even more worthwhile. And to sum this up, um, we can conclude the following. Or just to, to show the 2050 without saying we go to the conclusions straight away. Yes. Simon. Yeah, so um, uh, one, of the, one of the things is that the, uh, this is quite obvious, but still the, uh, the possibility of, of grouping production blocks will lead to a lower capex for the uh, installation of the connections. Uh, we uh, concluded that the interconnection of the technology blocks, as I said, they're not feasible due to the large distances. However, there are possible coordination benefits of uh, a few of these technology mix areas to uh, three particularly of the planned projects for cable installations. That is the Sicilian one, the Corsica, Sardinian one, and the one in the South Aegean Sea. Yes, and the second part of conclusion is um, basically um, two things that ob obviously the, the ambitious scenarios has some additional benefits to bring to the table uh, as, as opposed to the NACP scenario. Uh, in terms of uh, CO2 uh, cost emission uh, reduction and uh, increasing co consumer surplus, obviously not considering the necessary onshore grid enforcement uh, that that would have to be made, as Simon pointed out. And secondly, uh, we do see clear indications of that the interconnect option between France and Spain uh, through the technology mix area one, uh, 
uh, is certainly something that should be analyzed further because there are enough indications uh, in, in our analyze that show that there are clear benefits from this connection. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Simon and, and Frank. Uh, we got about eight minutes for Q and A, uh, and there were a number of questions. Um, first, um, one of the prior questions related to the decarbonization of the islands. Um, Frank has uh, reminded us that while we don't make any detailed studies, in the end, the decarbonization is implicitly taken care of in the in the market modeling that SWECO has performed. And then, of course, hydrogen and other means of energy storage will have a place in the future power system um, if they're economically feasible. So it's not an island by island specific decarbonization, but in some sense, at least uh, it, it's overall um, captured. Um, yes. There was a question about Cyprus, uh, whether the data on the potential for the onshore resources covered the entire island. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, then there also was a um, sort of visionary question from Angelo Labate on how these connections uh, would be optimized with the already existing HVDC interconnection projects, the Adriatic Link, uh, Sakoi and, and others. Um, this uh, is a super important question for us, but uh, points to beyond the scope of, of what we could do for this limited time uh, study. Um, we are hoping that with the um, analysis of the resource potential, and where the strongest and in which areas it is actually uh, most promising and how there it might relate to onshore reinforcements but also to other offshore interconnections that the TSOs have planned that both for the country governments and their national energy and climate planning uh, going into the future and for the TSOs uh, this can be um, some input, some some inspiration to include in their um, scenarios of the future, and to um, to then in the formal process covering the entire European continent with its market modeling, uh, potentially offshore bidding zones or not, and and things like that to be figured out over the next few years uh, can enter into a a routine process where Mediterranean offshore grid options are much more routinely considered than they are uh, so far. Um, Frank, I believe you still wanted to say uh, something in addition on the question of the uh, islands or on the question of the um, offshore grid uh, planning together with the onshore grid? Um, no, actually not. I, I think what, what we Maybe what we found out, obviously, is that, uh, or first of all, the 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 quantitative assessment of the onshore grid reinforcements uh, goes, unfortunately, beyond the scope of this project. What we found out, obviously, through the market modeling and assumptions that we use, is that uh, there are some bottlenecks that we clearly can see, and for 2050, especially in an ambitious scenario. Uh, we can clearly see uh, a stronger onshore grid reinforcement needs actually throughout uh, the whole of Italy as we inject so much um, uh, renewable uh, power in, in the 2050 scenario in, uh, in Sicily. And this is 2030, but we, it's much more in 2050. So basically, well, it needs to go up to the, to the load centers and, and that uh, creates uh, a stronger grid reinforcement need, which you are going to see in the market modeling by the, the the price differences uh and and that is of course something that 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 has to be uh, taken care of since what we do here is is major changes to to a system which usually is just gradually changed and already uh on shore um renewable installations that have been done the last 10 years they have changed it in a way that is perceived as major change, but these changes, they are major, major changes. And so obviously uh, great reinforcements are uh, almost everywhere uh, needed to, to a varying degree and to at a certain time. Um, 
Okay, um, our um, market modeling for figuring out whether the capacities that we found out as economically promising, whether they do fit into the overall market, that covered uh, also countries beyond the, the direct Mediterranean countries. Isn't that correct, Frank? The market modeling covers the EU 28, yes, correctly. And that's why we can actually look at the effects uh, for the Mediterranean countries, both in isolation, but also in, in total, and the other countries, yes. So all of the EU 28 are modeled. Yeah, and that, that was an important part for us to have a realistic picture of how it how it fits into an evolving uh, market, a pan-European, um, how it can be transported up to Germany or the UK or Sweden or something like that becomes a very different question way out of scope of what we could do. But at least in terms of the market prices, uh, we think we have made some uh, solid analysis and some, some rather interesting uh, results. Um, I think those are almost all the questions. There was another Cyprus question about offshore wind uh, off of the island of Cyprus and how that might relate to the interconnector. The con it, it might relate somehow. We haven't studied precisely how. Uh, Simon, can you uh, shed additional light on that? But we don't have much time right now. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the last part of your question. Can you repeat? The, the offshore wind, uh, how it relates to the interconnector that's planned anyway between Crete and Cyprus. Uh, we haven't made any detailed analysis of that. We've It, it was a uh, um, broad view analysis, just realizing that there are uh, common uh, cable paths likely. That's the level extent of that analysis. Yeah. And uh, and those were not the most cost-efficient uh, wind locations that we did find all over the Mediterranean, but it's one of the technology mix areas uh, we looked at. So um, I'd, I'd encourage uh, George with your question um, to, to look at the report that we'll distribute after today's uh, webinar. And uh, please do feel free to make additional comments or give us additions there. Uh, we'd love to hear uh, more more potential there. But with that, I think the Q&A session here on task three uh, needs to draw to a close. And um, we now come to the uh, barriers question uh, for which I hand it over to Carmen uh, Altas. Hello, Constantine, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yes, so I'm going to present the task four results. Um, and next to like the whole modeling and the potential studies, it's also important to see what are the challenges and major implementation barriers for offshore grid and offshore renewable development in the Mediterranean specifically. If we go into the next slide, it kind of shows uh, how we approach this. So what we really focused on was looking at what are the barriers specifically for those developments in the Mediterranean, looked at how do they how is the implementation or the impact of, of the scope of those barriers? So for example, looking at technologies, um, of course, various barriers in terms of technologies exist and are common to other European sea basins as well. We look, for example, at HVDC uh, protection systems, but these are already as extensively researched um, and more ahead uh, progressed in other sea basins. Whereas other technologies are very specific to the Mediterranean and um, require an acceleration in that sea basin as well. So, for example, floating wind is very key in the Mediterranean um, and requires an, an acceleration on that end. And then next, we looked at scoring and ranking of the barriers. So, here you see an overview of the barriers uh, and we divided them in different categories. So based on literature, we made a long list of barriers and we divided them in 10 categories. And these categories really range from grid design and grid planning in the offshore area to offshore renewable energy plant operation to market design to cost and social and environmental perspectives. As already highlighted, there is then a division between scope. Are they of course, all the barriers will play a role in offshore developments for offshore grid and renewables in other European sea basins, but some of them require very regional specific actions or regional specific solutions and alignments. And that's what we're focusing on and, and trying to uh, identify in this task. 
I'm moving to the next slide. How did we approach this? So this is an example how we approach each category of barriers. So this is really looking at the generation technologies and already uh, and the grid technologies and I already briefly focused upon that. Looking, for example, at HVDC protection versus uh, floating wind as key technologies for offshore grid uh, development. And we have, of course, various barriers within this category. And this is um, similar for all categories. And then we looked at how strong is the impact of this barrier on offshore grid and offshore renewable development within the Mediterranean specifically. And in addition to that, of course, it's important to define actions and mitigation measures. And there we looked at, for example, forms of support, um, uh, cooperation mechanisms, funding or horizon calls that could be set up to really accelerate um, the development specifically in the region. So, for example, looking at renewable generation technologies, there are, of course, uh, various technologies specifically to the Mediterranean that have still quite um, quite not yet evolved to full maturity. So a horizon call that looks at accelerating technology readiness levels for, for example, WAVE and other technologies specifically in the Mediterranean could really be an action and mitigation measure to make sure that this development is kick-started in the region. Moving to the next slide. So we looked at in detail to all the barriers and then grouped them in categories and we identified the strong impact categories specifically on offshore grid and offshore renewable development in the Mediterranean as being on the one hand, as already elaborated on um, offshore grid and renewable generation technologies. So um, specifically maturity levels or grid connection um, technologies offshore renewable plant operation and in particular uh, support schemes as um, Frank already pointed out in previous tasks, uh, power prices will probably not be enough for all technologies to recover revenues, so specific support schemes might still be required. And it's important there to ensure that these support schemes are in line with the EU state aid uh, guidelines and are also a bit more aligned in terms of um, design between the different countries moving forward. And of course, for example, for offshore wind, um, France already has a tender scheme in place. This could also be set up in other um, Mediterranean countries similarly to that. Then, of course, we're looking at administrative and governance processes. And here um, it ranges from mandates for the TSO or developments to occur in the exclusive economic areas, for example, of the countries, to really looking at what are um, the selected grid delivery models, who is in charge of which responsibility in designing the grid connection of renewables, connecting them to shore, um, all these responsibilities and governances should be um, clarified and ideally aligned between countries that cooperate uh, in a um, um, connected grid. And lastly, of course, there are very specific social and environmental constraints to the Mediterranean area. Thinking about uh, all the islands that are there and the high levels of tourism that really ensure there is fluctuating demand or very particular visual constraints or tourism constraints um, next to, of course, specific environmental constraints. So there are specific bird migrating routes, for example, um, that should be considered in um, the planning of the grid and in the offshore uh, renewable developments. Of course, the other category of barriers are also very important in offshore developments, but we see them or we identify them as likely to already be solved in developments in the other European sea base. already are ongoing of efforts on various barriers as well in the Mediterranean itself. And I really encourage you to also look into the report where we really detail um, each and every specific barrier and go in a lot more detail than we have time for here. So this was really to show a bit more an example of how we approached it and the key um, impacts that we identified. And next to the barriers and implementation challenges, we also looked at um, identifying best practices for key technologies or key barriers in the region. And again, here, this is only one example of a longer list of best practices that we identified. And the goal was not to really give an exhaustive list, but really to showcase developments that are ongoing and identify key learnings of this project for similar developments in other countries. Um, and here you can see, of course, the floating developments Floating offshore wind developments in France um, that are really a first in the region that could provide learnings in how um, offshore wind should be developed further, how the development and, and the 
governance process uh, should be set up as well. And this was it very briefly from task four. So we really looked at various implementation challenges, identified um, key mitigation actions, uh, looking at funding or cooperation alignments, et cetera, and identified key best practices and lessons learned to kickstart um, development of offshore grid and offshore renewables in the Mediterranean region. And I think now it's over to you, Constantin, for questions. I'm not sure if we... Yes, thank you very much, uh, yeah. Carmen. Um, that um, brings us to the Q&A part here. Um, we, I don't see uh, very many Q&A, in fact, um, none at all, uh, but we still um, do have uh, some time. Um, so I would encourage uh, the audience uh, that has been so nicely active with suggestions and hints uh, and questions uh, so far to see uh, whether this has all inspired you and um, maybe ask questions both about the uh, barriers part that uh, Carmen has uh, summarized just now uh, and the recommendations um, and perhaps also anything else that occurs to you now that you've seen the entire uh, breadth and scope of, of what we've studied uh, so far. Um, how does it strike you? Is this what you expected uh, when you heard about uh, a European Commission funded study of a Mediterranean offshore grid? Um, did it surprise you in any way? I would, I would encourage more questions in the stream here. Um, well, at least I was partially successful. Thank you very much, Maria Gaeta. There's been a question, um, have detailed hypotheses on how to finance and support offshore sources been analyzed? Do we have any regulatory proposals? Uh, and more generally, how will the work continue and are dissemination events scheduled for the end of the year with a wider audience? Um, I think Carmen and uh, possibly also Isa Kilichowska, who is our project manager, uh, might be able to answer this one. Yes, I'll get my first go in terms of uh, detailed hypothesis. Um, we really looked here into defining what are the key barriers. And of course, the next step would be um, how do you exactly implement the solution? You can make suggestions, which we already did in um, in proposed mitigation measures, but of course, detailed design of financing measures or support schemes in each of the countries will need to be set up in a in a next stage. Um, yet, in terms of how did, will the work continue? Yes, we have. Um, of course, this event was a very important milestone for us to get as much feedback um, as possible from from stakeholders involved, and we are planning to take part in other um, dissemination events uh, and events scheduled. Towards the end of the year, of course, there is still um, the ongoing question whether these events will take place uh, and when. And not Isa, if you want to add something at this stage regarding that. Thank you and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I was, was, to be honest, I was not intending to speak. Uh, I gave the floor to my colleagues, but, uh, but I'd be happy to share more insights on the next steps. And as Carmen has just said, indeed, uh, this is the second interim report, which summarizes uh, most of the analytical work that we've done so far. Um, and the next real step is to actually to take a step back to take a look at the big picture and to draw the major conclusions, uh, to give uh, further feedback for recommendations, further recommendations on how to proceed to facilitate development of offshore energies in the region. Um, we have been extremely lucky uh, to enjoy the active participation of uh, of stakeholders, of our advisory board, of our interviewees, of, of you, uh, participating in this workshop and we will very very much appreciate your comments and the reports that will be shared with you uh, right after the webinar because this will give us a chance to fine-tune and uh, and propose uh, the targeted measures uh, 
um, how to speed up facilitate the development of offshore energies uh, in the region. As Constantine has already mentioned, uh, we will appreciate your comments, your suggestions by the 3rd of July, so that we can incorporate them into the draft final report. And then we will spend the summer on, on, on bringing the big picture and uh, maximizing the effectiveness of the measures proposed um, for the final report. Uh, and eventual final results will be presented in the second half of this year um, at the final conference for this project, but, but also uh, in a couple of really important events like Wind Europe in Hamburg, um, at Power uh, at Cyprus um, and others. Um, so this is how we're going to progress. As such, your active contribution is key because we are doing this project for, for the benefit of the region and, and we want to make sure that you also feel comfortable with the study results. So we would like to encourage you again to, to provide comments and give feedback on the topics and we'll try to translate it to the final report as well as possible. Um, there's a few more questions. Uh, thank you, Isa. There's a few more questions uh, as we were speaking. Uh, on one hand, a strong interest, uh, especially from Italy, uh, from RSE, uh, to comment more with the suggestion that the 3rd of July might be uh, too early and um, suggesting uh, a bit more time. Um, Isa, can I place that with you to think about it? We're going to be sending out um, a link to the recording of today's webinar, uh, the slides and the complete draft uh, in time report. Um, to all the participants. So Angelo, you'll be receiving that shortly after and um, maybe we'll think um, whether we can make an exception to the 3 July uh, deadline for, um, for, for certain sort of feedback, uh, but, but I can't commit to that now. We'll need to think about it a little bit. There was uh, also uh, some earlier questions um on uh the scenarios uh for the onshore mix yes of course that's included in the report and when you receive that you can um, study it in detail and and then if necessary uh comment on it um and finally there was an interesting question uh that i see from antonio vasconcelos uh regarding financing and investment barriers uh related to the multi-annual framework uh, 2021 to 2027, whether there might be anything to be done there uh, that could be applied to offshore projects. Uh, I find that a very interesting question. I have no answer off the top of my head. Uh, Carmen, uh, does that question uh, perhaps uh, inspire you for an answer? Yeah, it's indeed a very interesting question. Um, of course, there is a lot of investment to be made in the region, so any kind of mobilization of capital or any in, uh, incentives to kind of de-risk uh, developers in the area could, could really help uh, and, and mitigate the barrier of, of development risk. So whether that could be coupled to the, the math, um, I'm not sure at this stage, but uh, it's definitely a, a good uh, suggestion or a good idea to look into further. Okay, Isa, I think you want to comment also. Yes, just briefly two comments. So regarding the 3rd of July as a deadline, um, uh, we'll get back to the audience uh, uh, shortly uh, once we agree with, with our colleagues from the European Commission. Um, I think I think it would be valuable to give more a bit more time to to give the opportunity for uh, for well thought of feedback and and giving giving us good suggestions. So I hope that's possible. But let let's let let's sorry um please uh, give us a chance to um to organize internally to make sure that uh, that we stay in line also with the european commission plans regarding the offshore energy strategy so let's make it uh, happen regarding the uh, the financing of um, uh, of renewable energies indeed that's uh, that's an important topic and there has been quite a few studies done over the last couple of years especially with it, uh, with the attention to um, to southeastern or southern europe uh, and um, and we've been lucky and 
personally as well been lucky to uh, to lead or participate in, in uh, two out of the three projects that Navigant had a chance to do in that respect. Uh, so this is really uh, something that we need to align with in the final part of this study and look into the projects like ORES, which is done on the horizon, where we are indeed investigating the, the measures to facilitate financing in countries where the cost of capital especially is a little bit higher in Europe. So this is indeed on our table. Okay, and there was a couple of last uh, questions that uh, came in here. Uh, there was one from Vessel Baka about the challenge to get agreement on regulatory and policy differences between the countries, if one is talking about any sort of offshore grid uh, meshing connections across borders, like the ones uh, we found promising um, in the Golf du Lyon between Spain and France, uh, and possibly also in the Adriatic uh, and near Greece. Um, yes, um, that that is a big challenge. Uh, that is, however, um, perhaps more generally similar to the challenges in the other seas uh, around Europe, in particular the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. And there's been a, a lot of, of work on that, for example, by the promotion project that uh, Carmen was involved in personally, and that is coming to a close over the next few months with a, a lot of regulatory and policy analysis uh, and, and also some interesting uh, recommendations. Uh, that was partially in the scope only of, of what we did, uh, but uh, we were lucky to have Carmen on the team to, to make the connection uh, there. Uh, in, in a wider sense, um, uh, this was a Mediterranean-wide study we did here. Uh, obviously, when we started, we didn't know where the promising areas would be. Uh, we weren't sure uh, what the wave height uh, and wave energy would be, whether it would be very expensive or not. We'll look into the additional resources we'll be getting from some of you right after this uh, with a great interest. But uh, of course, uh, as many research projects, this one went step by step. And um, from my personal perspective, I'm very happy that despite generally lower wind speeds, for example, in most parts of the Mediterranean compared to the Atlantic or the North Sea, we still managed to find a lot of economic potential and quite a bit more than what is being planned so far and in different corners uh, of the Mediterranean. And some of them, not all, uh, with some potential to interconnect with other countries uh, outside of Europe, even North Africa, uh, and between the countries um, in Europe. So um, uh, we consider this as a basis for further study. Uh, it might have been that we wouldn't have found any economic potential, then this would all shut down and the whole regulatory policy question, does it matter for 10E as Ricardo is asking, all of that would be focusing its attention on the Northern seas of Europe. But in a way, luckily the numbers that we found show, wow, there is quite some potential here. It's geographically focused, but in an aggregate, it's quite a bit, and it really makes up a fairly big put, uh, percentage of the countries that are on the European southern shores. So uh, when we do worry about offshore bidding zones and other regulatory questions like that, uh, that will need to be solved as we go forward with offshore grids anywhere around Europe, the Mediterranean will be a player, and the countries that border the Mediterranean will want to engage on that and we're hoping we're provoking that sort of reaction from, from the countries and, and are happy that we had quite a few participants from, uh, from the governments of those countries also in, in our webinar today. Um, uh, there was one last question that uh, came in from Panagiotis uh, about the geographical scope also including inland gulfs. Um, personally, I'm not entirely sure what's meant. Uh, Lou or anybody else, can you answer that one? Uh, yeah, I hope so. I also a bit hesit hesitant what exactly is meant with inland gulfs, but we included all uh, uh, water uh, directly connected to the Mediterranean Sea. So if there's any 
lake-like uh, inland uh, water that's not included. But if it's a gulf with a small entrance but connected to the sea, then it's included, of course. But on the other hand, of course, most of these gulfs so for offshore wind will fall within the limit of the 12 nautical miles, so won't be included in the potential. But yeah, potentially we looked at them. Yeah, wouldn't be included in the potential for offshore wind at least because it's it's visible and, and tourism yes. and other yeah. constraints. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Panagiotis, if that wasn't enough for an answer, feel free to um, to comment by email or or um, ask uh, other questions. Um, there uh, is a question that may have come up before and that we didn't address quite enough yet about the environmental uh, barriers, or some examples and how to address them. I think that may partly go to Lou, uh, but maybe Carmen should start answering that one. Yes, thank you. Indeed, um, good, good question. Um, I think maybe I can give a couple of examples. So one of them is, of course, the, the very uh, strict bird migration routes that are typical to the region. And I think Lou can comment there on possible mitigation measures for the operation of wind farms, for example, in the region. So I'll let that to him. Um, a second one is, of course, the, the environmental impact and that should be taken into account in the marine spatial plans of the different member states. Uh, most of them are or are currently in development um, as per the regulation um, and of course on a more regional level more cooperation on a regional spatial plan and uh, cross-sectoral integration plan to really identify the multi-uses of the sea and the different zones that could be used for renewable energy so that are kind of possible actions that could be taken on those ends I'm not sure Lou if you wanted to add something on how uh, mitigation could take place from migration routes yeah, yeah, I can, I can say some more. Well, um, uh, what we know is that now uh, is is uh, uh, coming into place more and more is is uh, bird radar. So uh, wind farms are uh, using this uh, device to uh, signalize if a large flock of birds uh, are in the environment. And then uh, if they are signaled, then they can turn down uh, and stop the uh, turning of the of the rotor. Um, there is some experience with the first installations of that, and it shows that uh, because this migration only takes place uh, two times a year, um, and other birds are, are, are much less frequent, um, the amount of time that this takes place is, is uh, limited and the uh, loss of energy is, is uh, if I'm uh, remembering correctly, less than 1%. So this is a real interesting option to, to extend the uh, amount of uh, possible areas where you can install uh, offshore wind. I uh, can also make another remark about environmental constraints. There are, of course, a lot of uh, Natura 2000 protection areas and they uh, show a lot of uh, area which is uh, excluded uh, potentially also in the Gulf de Lyon which is uh, as we have seen an interesting area for for wind offshore wind potential but um, if you look closer into the regulations then it, it says it's not completely prohibited uh, to do any anything there but that you have to take uh, uh, measures and uh, take me uh, mitigating actions. Uh, for example, uh, in the Gulf of Lyon, uh, the protection is about the seabed, uh, which is, is uh, in, in, in certain places protected. Um, but um, for example, uh, we are going towards larger wind turbines, uh, two, three, four, five megawatts, and we're also assuming uh, a power density of installations of seven megawatts per square kilometer uh, for offshore wind. So we're going towards one or two uh, wind turbines uh, per square kilometer. And we think therefore that it's it's possible uh, within such an area, for example, the Gulf of Lyon, to take mitigating actions and look for spots. Uh, where this one or these two uh, turbines per square kilometer can be installed. So that's another example of, of uh, mitigating actions that uh, can take place. 
Yes, and in the further future towards uh, 2050, I'm sure we'll be even far beyond uh, three to five uh, megawatts. Uh, some developments are going on right now, which, which are which are beyond that. So that that points even more in the direction, especially if you have floating wind, that there might be something there. Um, you know, our study needed to address the whole Mediterranean, and and we went to. Um, uh, we, we concentrated on certain areas, um, the Gulf de, Gulf de du Lyon uh, between Marseille and, and Spain um, has come up here repeatedly just because it has one of the strongest wind potentials uh, and because uh, the bathymetry, the depth of the sea uh, functions in a way where floating offshore wind might be possible in some quite large uh, capacity, but, but that also happens to be an area um, which is environmentally protected. So precisely in this area, this potential conflict is coming up. We looked into that a fair amount specifically for that region, uh, but of course there were limits to how detailed we could get into this since this was an all Mediterranean study. Uh, we're hoping that, that there will be a lot more work uh, by France especially, but, but also Spain on these things. And um, from what we've observed so far, what France is planning, this all looks uh, very optimistic and going in the right direction. We're hoping to push them into an even more um, ambitious uh, scenario with, with the results that, that we've produced. I don't see um, any further uh, comments or questions right now, and we're almost up on our two hour limit. Uh, there's only one minute left. Let me use the opportunity to thank uh, everybody for staying online uh, so long. Um, very few people needed to drop off earlier. Um, thank you so much for the enormous interest, uh, for the very good questions and including the comments and hints to some documents which uh, uh, we hadn't been aware of yet. Um, please keep those coming at least until the 3rd of July and whether we can extend the deadline some further, we'll let you know in the email that's coming soon with a link to the recording with the slides and with the 200 page report. We're looking forward uh, to your continued interest and comments and thank you very much for today. Thank you everyone.